Let's pray together. God, no matter what we think this morning, as we come before you, we come fully bare. There's nothing about us that you do not know and see. And Lord, today I pray that we would be honest with you and be true through and through. God, I pray that no pride would stand in the way of what you want to do for us and in us and to us today. God, I pray that you'd give us the ability to see ourselves clearly for a change. Not through the eyes of other people and what they think of us or what we may think they think. Not even through our own eyes, sometimes self-deceptive, limited at best. But God, through the eyes of you and you alone. And Lord, as we sing, as we listen, as we respond, as we leave here with the heart bent on obedience, God, I pray that we would know that you know the truth. Without you, we can do none of these things. We cannot please you without you. So God, for our sake, for our good, though it may hurt for a moment, God, take away our pride today. Replace it with dependence and trust on you. God, as we see ourselves clearly, help us to see you ever more clearly. God, do what you choose to do today. God, make this time exactly what you want it to be, God, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The subject of pride is a challenging subject for a lot of reasons. It hits everybody at some level. One old preacher said that when he preached about any other sins in the Bible, he knew he was preaching about the sins of men, but when he preached about pride, he knew that was a unique sin of devils, the demarcating sin of Satan himself, whose pride caused him to rebel against God. And you know, for us today, pride hits, it hits a unique spot for us. So many other sins in the Bible hit our weak spots, the, the parts where we already are given to temptation, the parts where we already know we have to shore ourselves up. But pride, that, that hits us differently. That hits us at our strong spots. That is just at the spots where we already think we're doing well, that we're succeeding, where in comparison with other people, we feel really, really good about ourselves. And pride creeps in, unlike other sins, pride creeps in under the, under the radar. And pride is often even applauded by others who, who would build it in us, not realizing that their, their applause and, and their praise is really making our situation worse and worse. So there are some today that by, by our sight, by their own measurements, they're doing great. But there's a pride issue there that keeps them from getting to the other side of where God really wants to use them and bless them. There, there's a pride there that keeps them from really knowing God's power and knowing what it really means to depend on Him and to know Him closely and to, to really love Him. For some others, pride takes on a different face, but just as destructive. On the other side of this wall is the you that God made you to be, the future that God wants you to still have, the future that is not dependent upon the past. It doesn't have to be the same at all, but, but pride keeps you from recognizing or admitting your real need. Pride keeps you from sharing it with anyone who could help you or asking anybody to pray for you or, or confessing it to anyone who could intercede for you and hold you accountable and encourage you and, and instruct you. Pride. G.K. Chesterton said if he only had one message left to preach for the rest of his lifetime, he would have preached it on, on pride. Just on the subject of pride. I want to share with you a parable today from one of Jesus' teachings. And I hope that through this parable, we will see ourselves. And there's a question, if you have your notes, you can follow along. If you're taking notes, the question I want to ask you is, of these two people that Jesus describes here, which one are you? Which, which one am I? Because the point of the story is really not so much the story itself. It's what the story tells us about ourselves. The character that we need to focus on is not a Pharisee who uses a particular example of a particular type of person, nor a tax collector who uses a different type of example. And just to make sure we get the context right, let's look at the forms that, that Jesus is using here. Jesus is teaching using extremes, like he often did, pitting two things that are very contrary against each other. He's basically putting people into two camps with this parable. On the one hand is the Pharisee. Now, when you think of the word Pharisee, we've sort of been conditioned in our church life to think that immediately registers negatively with us. We may not know exactly why, but we store them in that negative category. You know, for us Pharisees, you know, represent those who rejected Christ, those who oppressed the people, uh, those people who, who were, you know, so, in so many ways the villains of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Pharisees. They're an easy target for us today. 
Well, the Pharisees in Jesus' day would have not have been seen as a target so much. In fact, a Pharisee would have been the paragon of New Testament virtue, of first century virtue. This is what all of you aspire to be. These are the holy men among us. This is what the life of God looks like. If you're following all the laws, it looks like this. That's what they thought of a Pharisee. On the other hand, there's a tax collector. Now, we probably don't see a tax collector negatively enough. Now, I get it throughout all times and places in every culture, tax collecting is associated negatively. None of us want to pay taxes. We get that. But that's really not why they were seen in such a negative light. The tax collectors were Jews who were employed by the Romans. The Romans were hated by the Jews because they were their oppressors. Not only were they taxing them, they were controlling them, they were dominating them. Even their religious forms were controlled in many ways by the Romans who were ever present, ever vigilant over everything that they did. Several of us, uh, 28 of us, got to go to Israel and visit Jerusalem this past week. And one of the things that the people got to see in a model of the of the temple area during the first century, the time of Christ, is over in one corner of the temple area, there is a tremendous fortress, the Antonia Fortress, four huge towers. It was so that the Romans, under Pontius Pilate, could keep a sharp eye on everything that the Jews did. When hundreds of thousands would come up annually for Passover, maybe even approaching as many as a million people would arrive there for worship, there the Romans were always present, always watching, always guarding. The Jews hated them. And now you have these sellout Jews who were working for the Roman captors, and not only that, were they collecting their taxes, but they were cheating their own people, they were robbing their own people. So you have two opposite extremes. Here's what all of us are aspiring to be, and here's what all of us hate. Okay, so you've got these two contrasts. And in that parable, Jesus says this. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In that story, which one is most like you? Which one is most like me? Which one best describes the way that I see God? Do I see God as one that owes me favors on account of my virtuous behavior? God, look at all that I've done. God, you see it better than I do. I'm not like all these people. I don't do what they do. And he begins to go down the list of some of the more egregious sins that people commit. God, I'm not like that. I want you to know something. Let me throw this in as an aside. When it comes to godliness and behavior that pleases God and a life that God loves, the lowest level of godliness, the lowest level of living life that's pleasing to God is the things you don't do. That's just the simplest level. To to feel like you've achieved something because you don't do something now is really borderline ridiculous. You don't do all those evil things. That's just the beginning step. That's, That's basic foundational level of morality. What God is looking for is what you do, not just what you don't do. Where's your love for me? Above all other things, where's your love for people? Where's your passionate, God-like heart? Where's a heart that reflects my heart? That's what I want to see. I want to see the positive effect of me and you, not just that you don't do all these things. You see, that's moralism. See, I could do this today. I could say, if you will quit, and I could begin running down this list of things, if you will quit doing these things, God will be pleasing to you. And you know what? Some of you in your own strength could quit those things. Just through sheer force of will, you could say, you know what? I'm going to put my cigarettes down. And I'm going to quit saying that word that I use all the time. And, and, I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to turn my TV off and, and I'm going to run down the list. And I'm going to give you these things to do. And what would that create in you? What would that change in your relationship with God? Maybe you would be more socially acceptable. Maybe your family would like you better. Maybe we would accept you better and promote you in church life. But would it really change anything between you and God, your self-righteousness, your own ability to perform? Maybe it would create in you an attitude like this Pharisee. 
who is so reliant on what he's done that what he's really saying to God is, God, I don't really need you because I'm doing all of these things and I'm not like anybody else. Now, sometimes that comparison game creates the same sort of pride in us. This is almost as if there was a time in our life where we did recognize we needed God. And by the way, if that time hasn't come for you, you can't really say that you were truly saved. Because our salvation has to be based on a time and point in our life where we threw ourselves at the mercy of God, realizing there's nothing in us that saves us. That there's no equation that adds up to God saying to us, hey, welcome to heaven, I'm glad that you're here. Apart from his righteousness, we sing about it. We stand on his rock, his righteousness alone. Dressed in his righteousness alone, we sing. What does that mean? That means when you get to heaven one day, it's not about performance. And it's not personal righteousness. It's not about your moral code. It's about what Jesus has done for you. And you threw yourself at that mercy. In abject need, you said, God, I need you. And if you haven't done that, you don't belong to him yet. Your pride is still the wall that keeps you from God. But somewhere along the way, it's almost as if we said, not consciously, but subconsciously, we said, okay, God, I've got it from here. I've got it from here. And that's what religion does. Religion sets up codes that we can follow and feel good about. I got it from here. Yeah, I can do that. That's no problem. I can quit doing these things. I can start doing these things. I got it. And we lose that ever-present sense of dependence on God that God desires for us to have. That ever-present, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, I need your grace. God, I need your strength. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need your mercy, or I'm not okay. Or I'm undone. The man associated with sinfulness, with, with rebellion, with the, the man who was associated with betrayal of his own people, the, the tax collector prays something very differently. God, be merciful to me. Jesus gave a verdict on both men's spiritual condition. One went down to his house justified. The other went home unjustified. One went home feeling good about himself, but separated from God. One went home in brokenness, received by God. Pride. Pride has such deceptive power over us. When I say deceptive, it's because we don't see it. Sometimes we think we see it in others, but we don't. We just, it's so hard for us to envision. Let me tell you what pride does, just based on this one parable alone. Some things that pride creates in us. First thing is that pride isolates us. Pride sets us apart. Here you have this man praying, and the Bible says that he prayed by himself. That's not just his physical state of prayer. I believe that's his spiritual state too. When, when you've got pride in your life, and you refuse to recognize your need for God, or you refuse to recognize where you really stand with God, when you cut people off because you're more concerned with what they think about you than what is the real you, you think of of all the places in the world where you can really be yourself, I mean, where, where people really know you for who you are, well, would you call church one of those places? Most people wouldn't. Most people wouldn't. In fact, someone did a survey of the places where people are least like themselves, where they try to be most like something that they're not. One was in a car dealership. I don't know why. I guess we wanted to pretend. I, I can remember the first time I, I was going with a friend of mine to to look at cars, we decided one day, well, let's go look at cars just for fun. We'll go test drive some cars. And, and um, he's a little bit older than I am, gray hair, distinguished looking. He picked me up. I'm wearing shorts and a, I don't know, a t-shirt or something. No one would even speak to me at this dealership. I, I couldn't, no one, I couldn't, couldn't get any attention at all. Meanwhile, they toss him the keys to, to a new BMW and he just gets to drive around. So what's the deal? He said, well, look at it. You come here in shorts and a t-shirt. And you know, here, it's, we put on airs. We act like something we're not. You know the other common place? Church. We're afraid that people will see us for who we really are. And so we come in with built-in pride from the very beginning, and we're isolating ourselves, and we're cutting ourselves off from the very people who could help us, who would pray for us, who would pour their lives into ours if we would just let them. But see, the enemy's always telling us this. If people really knew you for what you're really like, they would not accept you. If they really knew the real you, you think they would ever look at you the same? Or he tells us a lie like this. You know you're the only one who ever deals with that, right? You come in with this sense of guilt or this thing you want to deal with and make right with God and the enemy's telling you, whoa, whoa, you better keep that one to yourself because no one else is like you on that. 
We come in with our pride and we leave with our pride and we leave unchanged. Pride isolates. And for the person who's like the Pharisee, who judges everyone else and thus feels good about himself, he, he bases his own spiritual measurement on how everyone else is doing. You notice no one ever measures themselves against Christ. We'd rather measure ourselves against our peers. And inevitably, all of us can find somebody worse than us, right? Look around, you'll find them. They're not far from you right now. We do that and we feel better because we're doing a little bit better than others. How we look at people out there? You know, those people. You know the people I'm talking about. The people who get to lunch earlier than you. And don't blame me because I preach long. They just didn't go to church, okay? They had a built-in advantage. And you look with judgment on them, and you know who they are because, you know, they're not wearing jackets or ties or dresses or anything. It looks like they just rolled out of bed, and we, we judge them. We were walking in the old city of Jerusalem yesterday or day before. I, I, can't, I don't even know what day it is today. It's been so much travel time. We're walking. We go in one of the city gates. Now it's a Friday, so I do know what day it is. Friday, day of prayer for the Muslims. They're praying up on the Temple Mount. It's a special occasion, so more people than normal are praying there. And they're praying there at the Dome of the Rock. You may have seen it. They're praying at the mosque that's there adjacent to the rock. Our bus driver was one of those that went up to pray. I asked him how many people he thought were there today. He said maybe 200,000. 200,000 people to pray. Now we come into the city at about the time they're all coming down from the mount, exiting the city. There are only four gates to exit the old city. I think 90% of them were exiting the gate we were trying to go into. So here's 28 of us, 200,000 of them. We're going one way, they're all going the other. It was a cultural experience, very rich indeed. And several of us heard people calling us infidel. We heard things being shouted at us. The praise song, quote unquote, that they're singing to Allah was very angry chant, often directed at us, little children turning and pointing it at us. I could get their feeling that, you know, here are the unbelievers, here are the, here are the infidels. Here, here are those people who, who don't believe. I think that's, that's what pride does. Pride puts us on, on a pillar where we don't see people as they really are. Pride also, number two, blinds us to our own reality. That's the horrible nature of pride is that someone who begins to feel so good about themselves and what they've achieved that they no longer see their need for God. And here's a Pharisee who certainly felt a lot of self-accomplishment. I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I'm not like them. What is your reality? Because your goodness is not going to be enough. Your good works don't undo the bad. And that's probably the worst condition of pride is number three, that it leaves us exactly where we are, untouched by God, still in our sins. So whether you're that person who feels so good about yourself and your own righteousness, untouched by God. Or whether you're that person who, who on the inside has got a storm brewing and you don't know what to do with it, but your pride, because you're more concerned about your image, you're more concerned about your reputation, uh, you're more concerned about people's perception of you and how they're going to respond to you, you're, you're ultimately more concerned about them than you are God, that pride, whichever way it raises its ugly head, it, it leaves you in the same condition, untouched by the hand that can heal, that can make the difference, that can give you what you need. And pride ultimately does this. Pride subjects you to God's hand that humbles it subjects you to God's humbling hand. And I want you to make yourself a note there if you're taking notes or if you're following with mine. Maybe a little asterisk or a mark. When God humbles a person, I mean, when God breaks a person, that's not out of anger. That is not a statement of God's judgment. When God humbles a person, that is a statement of God's love and His mercy. Because if God was not merciful, God would leave us in our condition. Remember we talked about secret sins a couple of weeks ago. And how those secret sins become our wall. That's who we really are, who we are in secret. And those things that we do that no one knows about but us and God, that's reality. And until the, the secret personal life matches the public perceived life, we're never going to get over that hump. We're never going to get to the other side of that wall and become the person God wants us to be. That's, that's reality. Well, in the same way, as I discussed with you last week, if God were to leave us in that condition, leave us for those secrets just to grip us more and more and become more and more entangled in that secret twisted life, hidden from the real life, that would not be mercy. That would be judgment. For God to leave a person in their sins and let a heart grow harder and colder and darker, that's mercilessness. That's judgment. But for a person to be found out, for a person to be uncovered, for a person to have to deal with that secret life, that in fact, though painful, is merciful. 
in the same way with our pride. If God just were to leave us in our condition, feeling like we don't really need God, we're self-sufficient, we're independent, we're self-righteous, we've got it all figured out, our moralism is our gospel, if God were to leave us like that, that would be harsh judgment indeed. If God were to leave a person resisting him and, and not willing to be honest with who they are and honest with their needs and honest with their struggle and, and cry out to God, if God would leave a person like that, that would be merciless. But if God breaks a person, that's for that's for goodness. Because in that brokenness, we really know God. I believe it was A.W. Tozer who said, whole, unbruised, unbroken men are of little use to God. It's not until we see how much we really need God. I won't ask you to raise your hand or, or anything. I want you to think about this in your own mind. But I would guess a vast percentage of people in this room, at least the adult people in this room, I've had a time in your life of such great difficulty or personal pain or loss, some significant event in your life where you grew desperate for God. You felt desperate for God. In that moment, I want you to think back, how did you approach the scriptures in that moment, in that period? With what kind of hunger did you look through the Bible for an answer, for a sense of direction, for an encounter with God? How did you pray? With what kind of earnestness did you pray? With what intensity or frequency did you pray? To what degree did you invite other people into your crisis and say, I need you to pray for me? With, with whom did you share it with? People that you, that you trusted, that you had confidence in? What sort of dependence did you have on God at that moment? How did you throw yourself on his mercy? How did you cry out for him? How did you convey to him, God, if, if I don't have you, I don't have anything. God, if you don't help me through, I'll not make it through. God, I cannot do this without you. At that moment, you knew what it was like to be dependent upon God. God wants us to be ever dependent on Him, ever hungry for Him, ever desiring a word from Him, ever in conversation with Him in prayer, ever throwing ourselves at His mercy. That's who God responds to. How serious is pride to God, by the way? Because I think in our own minds, we would, we would certainly subjugate it to the lesser sins. I mean, the Pharisee certainly did. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not like this Pharisee. No, but you had much, much pride. How serious is pride? Well, if you go to Proverbs 6, 16, you'll see a list. These six things God hates. You know what's first on the list, right? Pride. If you go to the New Testament and you look at 1 Peter 5, 15, there's even a promise there associated with God's view of pride. God opposes the proud but he gives grace to the humble. He opposes them. Okay, now track with me here for a moment. Here's a man who's gone up to the temple to pray. Now, at least ostensibly, he wants to talk to God. He wants God's favor and pleasure. Imagine a man who's praying to God and God is actively opposing him. Imagine a person who comes in a church service and is singing a song to God, but God is actively opposing them. They're giving him a gift of offering thinking they're pleasing to God, but God is opposing them. You know, we have so many subjective ways we measure church and, and a church service. People say, I really felt the Spirit moving today, which could be as simple as they like the song or the message was to their liking. Other times people say, you know, I didn't really get anything out of that today. There's just nothing there for me. Have you ever considered that you might be coming, thinking you're coming to honor God, but God is opposed to you? He's opposed to your prayer. He's opposed to your song. He's opposed to your gift. He's opposed to your service because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You see why Satan works in that area of pride so much? That he knows as long as we can keep up this facade of, okay, I got this. I don't need that. I'm not like these other people. I'm not weak like them. I'm not needy like them. I don't need to come and cry like them. I don't need to come and ask people to pray for me like them. I don't need to, to come and ask for help like them. I can do this. I can fix this. I got this. As long as Satan can keep up that veneer as thin as it may be of pride, he knows that the help that we so sorely need never reaches us. It never gets to the other side. But here's what God does in mercy. Here's what God does to our pride. Now, I'm going to read you a passage of Scripture, and I want to make sure you understand the connection here. I'm going to read you a passage of Scripture from the Old Testament, from Isaiah. In Isaiah, we see a picture of how God was dealing collectively with the sin of pride with his nation, with his people, Israel. People that he had created for his own pleasure. People he had created to reflect him to a godless culture and world. People he had made so that they would love him with all their hearts. 
Do you see the correlation between God's people Israel then and God's people the church today? God made you to love you. He made you so that you would reflect him to this world like the moon reflects the glory of the sun, that we reflect the glory of the Son of God into a world that needs him, that we would be his people and we would love him and show him to the world. But they didn't. They were proud and they were rebellious. And so God brought judgment on them. And listen to how this is described. He says, hear you deaf. This is Isaiah 42, 18. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf is my messenger whom I send? Who is blind is my dedicated one or blind is the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but he doesn't observe them. His ears are open, but he doesn't hear Hey, that's a message to you and me today as, as well as it was to them. Is it possible that God's saying things to you that you're hearing the words, but you're not hearing the author? You're not hearing the message. He's showing you things, and though you see what's happening, you don't really see. You don't see what God is doing. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is how I want you to live. This is what God has chosen. My law is glorious because it points you to me. But this, listen to what he says, this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plundered with none to rescue, spoil with none to say, restore. He said, this is your real condition, okay? Plundered and looted. I made you to live a certain way. I made you to live with my presence among you. I made you to live according to my law so I could bless you. I made you to live to joyfully worship me and give me your whole heart. But all that's been taken from you. The joy of me has been taken from you. The joy of your obedience is gone. And the enemy has come in and he's stolen it from you. So that's the way the enemy works today. God made you to love him and to know his love for you. And the enemy comes in in so many ways and wants to rip it away. And he says, this is your condition. You've been plundered and looted. You're, you're trapped now. You're in prison now. This is not who I made you to be. Behind this wall, this is not what I made for you. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will attend and listen for the time to come? Now when he says they've been plundered and looted, the Babylonians had done it. The Assyrians had done it. They'd come in and taken the things from God's temple. They'd come in and robbed the people. They had subjected them to slavery. Why? What had happened? Who gave up Jacob, that's Israel, to the looter? And Israel to the plunderers? Who did this? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned and in whose ways we would not walk and whose law we would not obey? So he poured on him the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, and he didn't understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. And when I read that passage, I think that's not just about Israel so many hundreds and hundreds of years ago. That's about you and me today. We begin to live in a way that doesn't please and honor God. We live like there is no God. We live like we're not dependent on him. And the enemy comes in, and he robs and pl pillages us and, and plunders us and takes from those things God wants us to enjoy and have. And families are wrecked and ruined and individual lives are wrecked and ruined and hidden sins destroying. All these things happening. He says, then these consequences begin to come. It's like the walls begin to fall down around us. The fires burn all around us, but we don't get it. We don't understand yet why. We still don't see. And what God is doing is keeping a promise. And the promise is this, that he will break us for his glory. That he will break us for his glory. Because he loves us too much to leave us in this condition. He loves us too much to, to leave us in our stubborn pride. To keep living as if we don't need him. And so that we can see our dependence on him again. And so that people can see us turning to him again. God breaks us. He promised the Israelites this in Leviticus 20, 19. He says, I'll break the pride of your power. And in NIV it says, I will break your stubborn pride. And I believe God still promises to do that today. And again, he does this. When we have turned against, turned our heart and, and, and our vision opposite God and we don't live in a way that pleases him, when we're so self-sufficient, we don't realize we need him, we're dependent upon so, other, so many other things that we don't depend on him, God breaks us not just in anger, but in love. Because what he wants most is, is us, our dependence and our affection. How does he do this? How does God break through our stubbornness and our pride and our self-sufficiency? One, he reveals his will through his word. And through the word. We have the scriptures that show us how God wants us to live. We have the scriptures that recount so many stories of people 
who were blessed when they were dependent upon God, who were resisted or even opposed to when they were against God, when acting as if there was no God. And we have the message of Christ Jesus himself. And one of the hardest lessons the disciples ever learned was a lesson of humility. In fact, it was the last lesson that Jesus taught his disciples when he washed their feet. You know, those of you who want to be the greatest have to be the servant. You want to be the greatest of all, you've got to be the servant of all. It's humility that you need. Because already in the disciples' lives, no matter what they had seen or experienced in Jesus, already pride was cre creeping up. They were already thinking of the pecking order. And when the kingdom comes and Jesus is ruling and reigning, who's going to be number one and number two? They're already thinking in those terms. Jesus was saying it was your pride that's going to keep you. Another way that God breaks our pride is through our pain and through our despair. I believe it's C.S. Lewis who said that, that pain is the language that God uses to speak to a deaf world. Pain. It's a universal language. It's the one thing we all respond to. It's the one thing that causes us all to stop and to think and to consider. Sometimes uh, it takes more pain in some than others. We have different thresholds for pain that causes us to wake up and realize. You know, I still remember, and I, I still have the scars, which for me are, are a gift of grace to remind me physically what God taught me spiritually through pain. When I was 19 years old, and I've shared some of this with some of you, and most of it, many of you, I don't remember. But I can still remember that, that time of breaking both my arms and messing around, having fun, being foolish in a gymnasium with some of my friends after an intramural volleyball game and, and falling and, and crushing both my arms, breaking both bones, breaking both wrists. I spent eight days in the hospital, um, eight hours of surgery, putting those, all those little pieces back together. I spent 13 weeks before I could pull my favorite food out of a bag, a Cheeto, or a 16 weeks to a powdered donut, I think. And in that time of immediately getting pulled away from my school and my friends and all those things that I had poured myself into, those things that had taken away my affection from God, stolen my heart. It was in that moment of pain that God turned my attention back to him, that caught my eye, says, is this the life that I made you to live? Is this what I called you to do? Is this where I want your life to head? In that moment of pain and despair, God speaks. He speaks. Without that event, so many things would not have happened. I wouldn't be preaching. I would have been doing something else. I, I wouldn't be married to the person I'm married to. My life wouldn't be as it is. It's in that moment, those critical moments where God speaks through pain and despair. And at that moment, we've got a critical decision to make. Will we with eyes see what God is really doing, with ears hear what he's really saying, or will we just get more rebellious and more angry? Some of you are mad at what God has done in your life. Some of you are upset with God about the circumstances you find yourself in right now today. You're, you're embittered by it. And what God wants to do is say, no, turn to me. Turn to me. I want you to recognize that in your weakness, I am strong. In your confusion, I am wise. I'm everything that you need. You see, sometimes, number three, God does allow us to fall and to fail. I would never say it's God's will that pain and difficult things or, or failure comes into our lives. No. But I do believe in the sovereignty of God. I do believe that there's nothing outside of God's control. I do believe that nothing catches God off guard and God can turn circumstances meant for evil to good. I do believe that God can take the worst moments of our lives and he can redeem them for his sake and for ours. I believe that God can do that. And I believe that because God is God, there's nothing that happens to me or to you that belong to him that is not filtered by him first. So whether he is the direct causal agent or he is the indirect allowing agent, much like Israel, he did not cause their sin, yet they rebelled against him. And in their rebellion, an enemy came and swept them away. God allowed that. God caused that enemy to come in. It caused the sin that precipitated it. But I believe that God is in control. And so sometimes God does cause us to fall and to fail. Some of us have to hit what we proverbially call rock bottom, though most people have never gotten to the real bottom. But if that failure, if that falling causes us to realize, God, I need you all the time, then that's for our good. And it's certainly for God's glory. See, I think that's what God wants for us. I think God wants us to have that sort of dependence on him. God wants us to know where real strength comes from. God wants us to know where, where real wisdom comes from. And you know what that does for us? It doesn't make us weak. It doesn't make us foolish. It actually makes us stable and strong and healthy. 
because I know that no matter what happens, I still have a God who's in control. I still have a God that I can go to on my knees. I still have a God that responds and answers. But when I think I hold the weight of my life in my own hands and I, I control my own future, what, what pressure is that? You see, all these things happen, this pain, this despair, this falling, this failing, yet God never leaves those who are his. He never leaves us. He never abandons us. In Isaiah 42, we see this description of the pain and the fire and the destruction of, of judgment allowed by God, but yet they didn't see why. Verse 43, I mean, chapter 43 helps us see the why. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Israel, he who formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flames shall not consume you. In all these painful experiences of life, I'm there with you because you're mine and I won't abandon you. Isn't that good to know? Isn't that good to know that he's there? For I'm the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Verse 4, because you're precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. Verse 5, fear not for I am with you. Verse 7, everyone who called, is called by my name, I created for my glory whom I formed and made. And then verse 8, he says, bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All those who now see that this pain and this hardship is brought about by me, so you would turn to me. Those who will see this and hear this, you come out. Verse 11, I am the Lord and besides me there is no Savior. You should circle that verse for a moment. That's the point in life that God, by his mercy, is trying to get every single person in this room and every single person in this world to. It's to that point right there. And not just for eternal salvation. I mean, for us, sometimes we would reduce this meaning. We would say, okay, I get that. Jesus is the only way to heaven. I understand that. It's basic Christianity. No, Jesus is the only way to fix what you have broken right now. Jesus is the answer to the needs of your heart right now. Jesus is the solution to your deepest problems right now. Jesus is the answer to what you most need right now. He's the one that satisfies you. He's answered everything you're looking for, though you're looking in wrong places. It's Jesus. I am the Lord beside me. There is no Savior. There's no one to deliver you. There's no one to rescue you. There's no one to fix you. There's no one to help you. It's me. That's what I want you to see. And we can get to that point where pride goes away and dependence upon God takes its place. Then we know God. Then we really know God. And if God should reduce us to the point where we can't depend on others or ourselves or anything but him, then that is for our good. Because at that moment, we crowd him like they did. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And I am God. Also, henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? That's his sovereignty. Thus says the Lord God, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake, I send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. You see, God has promised this, that in our pain and in our hurt, if we will turn to Him, not against Him, not turn to self, but turn to Him in brokenness with a contrite heart, He will respond to us, He will revive us, and He will heal us. And that's what I want you to hear today. Maybe it took a long time to get to that one point. If you will let go of your pride, Stop acting as if you don't have real need. If you will be honest, admit the real hurts. If you will stop thinking that you can fix this, eventually you're going to get a handle on it. Eventually you're going to turn the corner. I got this. I can do this. I don't need anyone's help. If you will let go of foolish pride, recognizing that God is ready to give grace to the one who comes to him in humility, but he will continue to oppose, to resist the one who's proud. Then he's ready to heal the contrite or broken heart. For thus says the one who's high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who's of contrite and lowly spirit. Where is God? God's in the highest of the highs. The highest of the heavens is the home of God. But you know where he also is? You know the two times in your life where you're going to know him the most clearly and closely? When you see him in glory and when you see him in desperate need. In humility, when you cry out to him, you will know him because he is there in the high and holy place. And he's also with him who is contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Now I'm going to close with this thought and then I'm going to invite you to respond. He says, I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of life that I made. Let me tell you what he's saying there. For those of you 
who are in a battle with God right now. And God is breaking you, and he's trying to strip away your pride and your self-sufficiency. He's, he's undercutting all the things that you would rely on and depend on so that you would get to the point where you trust and depend on him alone. He will not always fight with you. Do you know why, according to that passage, do you see why? You could not endure it. You could not endure the constant battle with God. That's why the proverb says, you know, that he who continues to harden his neck, stiffen his neck, will suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. At some point, there's a breaking point. Just as God, in the form of the angel of the Lord, wrestled with Jacob in that tent that night, you can read this story in, in Genesis, he wrestled with him through the night, and then he touched Jacob on the hip, he gave him a permanent limp that moment. Jacob stopped wrestling with God, surrendered to the will of God. If Jacob had wrestled all night with God, he would not have survived it. You cannot continue this fight with God. He will not always contend with you, but he's waiting for you to let go of you and your pride and acknowledge, I need you, God. I'm desperate for you, God. And I can't depend on all these things. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face, was angry. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. That's the story of me and you. I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. That's mercy. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of his lips. Peace, peace to the far and the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Listen, God is ready to meet you at your point of need if you'll be honest and admit it. Pride in two forms. There's a pride of the Pharisee who doesn't see his real condition, and because of his own self-sufficiency and good works and self-righteousness and moralism, he thinks he's okay with God, but he goes home every day unjustified. And one day he'll stand before an almighty God who will say, depart from me, I never knew you. On the other hand, there's that broken person who still with their pride will not admit their real need. Will continue to resist God even though the fire burns all around them, the destruction is happening all over them and they still refuse to see and refuse to hear. And as if God is saying, how long will you fight with me? How long until you will give up and surrender to me and come to me in humility and let me heal you? Let me heal you. God wants the same thing for all of us. He wants us to love him with our whole hearts. He wants us to depend on him for all of our lives. He wants us to be close to him faithfully for as long as we live. And he wants us to know him, to genuinely know him, to know the God who is our healer and our provider. And there's one wall that stands between you and knowing that God that way. And that wall's pride. Let's pray together this morning.